Hi, Book Club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 58, and our book is For the Emperor, out of the Hero of the Imperium Omnibus of Caiaphas Cain by Sandy Mitchell. This is the first story that really introduces you to the famous Commissar Cain and his misadventures across the Warhammer 40k universe. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Vox channel. Spoiler warning. Maybe a lighter spoiler warning. If you haven't yet read any of the Caiaphas Kane stories, we're going to talk about the book in start to finish, from start to finish in great detail. Really, we're not spoiling story so much as some of the jokes. Because... Right, because it's not like any of this, I think, it has a greater impact right on the whole but it's like a day in the life of commissar kane yes which um first off did you like the book i did and i want to real quick we have a special guest this evening you forgot to introduce him like you guys all meet big steve big steve is with me tonight big steve is with her tonight it's been a week for us both I uh, I got Ingron with me tonight, so no big Steve for me. But yes, I love the book. This was like a book like I was laughing on my couch, and of course, my husband, my eldest son, would be like, "Okay, what's so funny?" So I'd read aloud the passages, and even they would be cracking up. You know, the funny thing is that some of his phrasing, it really is kind of universal. Like, you don't really have to understand the Warhammer 40 King universe to understand why some of this is so funny. Um, I was so happy that you enjoyed this book because I kind of had this moment of fear before we started reading it. I was like, oh no, like, what if I oversold this? Because I find it very funny and I love Commissar Kane, but there's always that concern, like, God, I hope I didn't overhype this one. And so really happy that you also enjoyed it. I was also happy to see because... I don't even remember when For the Emperor was written, but it's an older book 2003. Now. Oh, gosh, yeah. I was like, this is an older, older book. Um, <clears throat> my uh, and I copy. Think, I think it's just fine. It, it's, yeah. it's aged well. It is. It doesn't. I would actually say it's aged flawlessly because it doesn't feel aged. Like, you don't read it and you're like, mm, this was clearly an older book, wasn't it? just in terms of like the lore and the story and the wording and the characters like it doesn't have any of the hallmarks about, of an early outing about the only stuff is the imperial guard oh yes versus astro militarum and the eldar versus the aldari but that's mm-hmm. minor considering that they just made that official change like two years ago something like that so yeah it's okay yeah that's about it and even then you can still the best part about Kane is because he's a reliable-ish narrator. You can always just say, oh, that's just Kane's way. Like, yeah, he would use these kind of antiquated terms for all of this stuff. It totally works, right? So, I actually, you know, I have to say, I think he's a very reliable narrator because he doesn't paint himself in the best light. And I can't imagine uh, if he wasn't really like why he would do that unless there's always supposed to this is all for show a little bit more about that because there's a lot to discuss there I feel like first off what part stood out to you you know honestly probably the part that stood out to me the most is the plate fight and uh, between the old regiment, the two old regiments, the plate Gosh. fight. And he the gets crockery. in there. Yeah, he gets in there and realizes no one's noticed me. I think I'm going to sneak on out. And that provost is like, Commissar, help. And everyone stops and turns. And he immediately is like, you, get a broom. This is like an awful mess. And takes command of the situation in this way that's just so insane. But it works. It stops the fighting. It makes him like clean up and uh you know for all of his is at that moment honestly for all of his bravado that he's 
uh, you know, a big coward and doesn't know what he's doing, he can take command of a situation very well. And he's a better strategist than he lets on. It's, it's funny because you would imagine for a commissar that just wants the easy life, it wants to stay out of trouble, to maybe not be so good at strategy. But he is. And he's really good at dealing with people. Whether, I mean, he says it's all a facade, he masks who he is to be where he needs to be, but isn't that kind of part of being a commissar? I think that's just so part of let's it. Let's really, let's really dive into that, because that's one of our questions. Let's really talk about, like, what you think about Caiaphas Kane in general. Because for all of his bluster of, look, I just want to live and I'm a giant coward, he's shockingly effective. I mean, he's, not only is he a good commissar, He's a very good leader, right? Like, really, to that point, when he's talking and he's a to Brokelaw. I mean, hmm? he, he knows how to fight. I mean, it's not that he's just this, this big wuss. And, you know, in his whole comments about, you know, I'm always looking for places to dive cover, I'm like, that's just good strategy, to be honest. You right? can't lead people if you're dead. Um, and, yes, I mean, in the, the very first short story that was the origin of Caiaphas Cain, where he talks about how he snuck off the ship and then ends up, you know, getting caught in the middle of a bunch of gene stealers. If he was such a coward, he would have he would have found another way, but instead he's able to roll with it, get out orders, and saved everybody. Right. But like So yeah, he may have been when... trying to run away. I believe that for sure. He's just like, Oh this yeah, is not for what I signed sure. up for and I'm out. But it doesn't mean that when he's faced with the situation, he doesn't know how to how to handle it. You know, you know, when you take all those personality tests, you know, like as a kid and everything else. Well, one of mine that always pops up is that I'm only a leader in something when I have to be. Meaning that if there's right. nobody else stepping up, I will step up because someone's got to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I see him a lot. Very much so. And. He is, and that's why I say that he's reliable to a point, because he sits there and he's like, oh, like, I'm such a master manipulator. Okay, yes, that's a way to look at it. Or are you just a really good leader? Again, when he's negotiating with Cassine and Brokelaw, and he's like, we're going to combine into one regiment. That's pretty brilliant, right? Because he notices the problem immediately and he comes up with a solution that makes neither party particularly happy, but that's good because now they have a common cause, right? And like that whole scene, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, you are shockingly actually very good at this. And when he can hold his own against an inquisitor, right? Like he's sussing out details and they're in this these tunnels. The whole thing with saving the... um. I mean, he's, the people he's brilliant he really is and he but he downplays it as like look it's just because i don't want these people shooting me in the back or hey, i'm just a coward and trying to save my own skin here right like he downplays it and yes there is a little bit of that like um the scene when they're in the truck and he's like well i need to have somebody between me and the bullets so he like pulls the yeah. injured girl up with him because he's like okay good now i've got shield body shields okay there's a little bit of cowardice there but again, like, you're right. He walked, like, when the provost sees him in that fight scene, and he's like, okay, how do I take control of this? It's a pretty brilliant solution to just be like, clean it up. Do this. Do that. You guys over here. Like, just acts kind of like nothing happens. It doesn't mean that nobody's getting in trouble for this. Right. They do. And you that guy's scene, kind of, like, stab the provost in the neck with a broken plate. You just, you don't get to walk away from that. Yeah, and like the whole thing with um, how he kind of tricks the captain of the ship, right, right, out of his out of his execution. It's like, well, yeah, we're just gonna send him to a penal legion, right? It like right. It, it shows a brilliant leadership quality. And speaking of those guys, in the end, when the two troopers, I was so emotionally invested in them, when <laughs> they come up and they're kind of dazed, and he just immediately shoots them. Because he's yeah. like, oh yeah, it's gene, it's gene stealers. Like the guy's not stupid. I one of the things that I read about him once, and because it had been so long since I have read Caiaphas Kane, I was kind of like, oh, that's probably right. Do you remember, um, 
I think it's the third Harry Potter movie, and I say movie over book, because Kenneth Branagh, he plays the Defense Against the Dark Arts professor who doesn't know what he's doing. He's just been stealing. Is that the second book? Okay, that's the second one. When he's just stealing everybody's things. Yes. Like, but he sucks. He doesn't know what he's doing. People had compared Caiaphas Cain to that, and because it had been so many years, I was like, I guess. But reading this again, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't even see Kenneth Branagh playing him. Oh, no. Mm-mm. He is 100% um, that guy whose name just totally. Oh, man, you even oh. told me this, too. He plays House. He was on Black Adder. Yeah. That him. Guy. 100% I, him. I could see Can him. be goofy. Can be goofy. Can be a little like, you know, hmm, trying to save my own skin here. Very competent, though, and really does know what he's doing. He's not, and that's what makes him such an interesting character, especially in the world of the Imperial Guard, is that he's funny, he's self-depreciating, but he has serious business. But, you know, another part that really kind of got me is when you think Jurgen's dead, because the wall collapsed, and he said, for reasons I must have just been in shock, I start digging at the rubble, because I would never care about anybody else but, but, but myself. I'm like, dude, now you're just, you're trying to make yourself sound really bad, but you actually do care about Jurgen, and you did care about Loves Sorrel Jürgen, even and, though... uh, and Halimbi and uh, was it Trebek? Trebek. Mm-hmm. You did care that they got left behind. He does, very much so. And that is one of those things, and especially Jurgen, like for all the all like the smack he talks about how bad he stinks and blah 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 like he... Yeah. But, he you know, when, the, when the psyker freaked out at him and, you know, basically was like, you know, he's an evil like, or, or, or an unclean man or something like that and freaked out mm-hmm. and passed out. And he was just like, okay, you know, maybe he's kind of weird and smells bad, but that's kind of harsh. It was know? way harsh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was like, okay, so you, you do like him, whether like you want to ad- admit it or not, like, you know, like, I, like when Jer- they thought Jurgen was gone. He's like, oh my god, look at all this paperwork I have to do. <laughs> like, like right? There's kind of like an actual affection there, but a little bit of a callousness too. Like, well, but he made sure that I didn't have to do all this paperwork. Like, and he was, that's, I mean, always at his beck and call. You know, very much. even so. when the commissar didn't realize that he needed it, because like he saved him, I don't know how many times in that last Seriously. fight. Seriously. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's kind of, and like the more Caiaphas Cain that you read, because you even remember in that story about the um, when they go to the show, right? Jurgen just pops up there. It's like within his idiom that at the end there, he rolls over the thing with a truck, right? He's just, he has this uncanny, which is really kind of funny for him being a blunter. Like he almost has. All right. So I did not see that coming. Oh, really? At all. No. I was expecting something like a little more sinister the way they were talking about him and how awful he could possibly be. And it's like, are we saying he's a gene stealer? Are we saying that, you know, these half Eldar, like, what are, mm-hmm. we, what are we trying to say? That's what I was like, I was leaning more towards than, than a blank. Because honestly, when I get outside of Dan Abnett, I don't think about blanks being there, to be totally Fair. honest be totally honest i can't i really can't this is probably maybe the first book i can think on top of my head that has a blank um other than a sister of silence that doesn't like in yeah that doesn't count um probably yes they're not huge at least that we've read for this series they're really not that big in the universe and it makes sense why they aren't right because he even mentions in the beginning of the book that like Nobody really likes to be around Jurgen, and he's like, "Oh, it's because he smells so bad." Um, more about that. But there's, like, he always talks about like, "Oh, he smells so bad," and other people really don't like to be around him very much. And he's like, oh, "I can't blame him because the smell, right?" But it explains it, right? And it makes sense why Jurgen. Yeah, people kind of give him a wide berth, and you may it makes sense why these people aren't hanging around large groups of people. Not everybody wants to be around blanks. Like, even non-psychers recognize there's something not right about right. this person. And so it makes sense that you don't see them everywhere. Um, I just honestly thought they were a Dan Abnett fun. creature, and that was it. And no one else ever used them. Because it just seemed like they were his baby. Because he liked to he, overuse them. 
he definitely fleshed out the lore and the mythos around them. I would say probably the most of any author. Um, he really likes them. Well, because they're such an interesting concept. And then he likes to break right? his own, own rules with them. We don't talk about that. I'm still bitter about the ending of Ravner, and I'm still bitter about some of the parts of Penitent. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, he does like to break his rules with them. Uh, that doesn't really happen in here with Jurgen. Uh, but Jurgen yeah. also, um, he just it's such a neat piece of Cain, especially with his mythos. Again, somehow not only has Cain kept himself alive, he's kept Jürgen alive. Right. It's like his, I don't know how to say this without sounding terrible, but it's like his little lost dog. His I little was gonna stray, say, right? his lucky rabbit's foot. It kind of is like his lucky rabbit's foot. Like a really smelly version of Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> Just saying. And um, can I say how much I absolutely loved I forgot of how heavy the romance is with between Amberly and him in this book. And not like over the top. Like it's not No, it was one of those things like It's not like the racial hair. Kind of hinted it, but there was some footnote and I was like, Oh yeah, okay. Oh, when she talks about how she's known that he's woken up from nightmares. Yeah. Yes. And you're like, Oh yeah. Very subtle. Yeah, how how else would you know that? <laughs> right. Inquisitor? Yeah. But then also watching these two master manipulators kind of flirt with each other. Right. Really super fun. Right. And I, there's just somebody in the galaxy for everybody. It's true. Is what I'm saying. Maybe even if he can again. find Charlie <laughs> Bell. I, oh my God. So, really quickly, bouncing back for a sec, the style of this tone of this book is unlike anything else we've read. Did it work for you? It's so refreshing. <laughs> it's so refreshing isn't it um i would you know, say probably the closest thing was uh the infinite and the divine uh yes but i was gonna say it was kind of like um you know that warhammer preview the hammer and bolter preview uh old bailey that was hilarious but it was very serious at the same time and it right did a really good balance between the two and i really felt like this did the same mm -hmm. now i am going to get leery if gene stealers pop up everywhere because gene stealers have their uses but man you know first that short story and now this i'm like please tell me they don't pop and, oh and then that other short story i read before I even read any of this it's like okay come on like i can't deal with gene stealers all the time he does run into them an inordinate amount and i think the reason for that is that when you think about it not only are they a very insidious enemy, so they're very easy to overlook, but because so much of dealing with the gene stealers is dealing with the varying degrees of the hybrids. A lot of them start out very human, so it's a human enemy that other humans can fight, right? Like, it does kind of downplay, so, not downplay, because obviously, like, once once the pure strain hybrids show up, all, all bets are off. Now it's super dangerous, but it does... I think they are probably a little bit more prolific and also it does make it a little easier to have humans fighting them because eventually like with the orcs right if it's constantly the orcs or even the eldari well i don't like, want the i just don't want constant enemies like the whole time because that cause that just gets old like we've we've talked about much. that before with um with other books like it's like oh my gosh it's the same enemy over and over again mm -hmm. yeah i would agree with that yeah it's um i mean and, uh, I, I understand it's also with the gene stealers it's so easy to peel apart the fragile layers of government with what the gene stealers do you know very much so like so for example i knew governor grice was shady like i knew he was on the side of something but i was not expecting him to be the assassin so let's we'll jump down to that one then were you surprised by the angle that whole yeah. Did it make sense? It did make sense. It made perfect sense. I was like, well, that's why they couldn't find anybody. It makes total sense. Um, you know, and he was such a good actor. Like, I knew that he was not on the up and up. I just thought he was on the Tau payroll, not... I didn't think about the third party in this. But, you know, nobody did until they got to a certain point. when so they're like, oh, okay, now I see what's going on. And... Person right, kind of cracked me up that when it was over the tower, just like, all right, you know what? You guys want this? Peace. We're out. <laughs> yeah, we're out. 
Gene Steelers, no. I did love when they were trying to. Ex- Gorok died though. You guys, I love the Croot. Don't touch my Croot. Don't talk to me or my fabulous dinosaur boys ever again. I. I love the Croot always. The Croot because the the Croot are at their heart just the ultimate mercenaries, right? Just point them at an enemy so for money. The Croot make me think of. Uh, I forget what they're called, but it's this certain alien covenant race in Halo. They're the snipers. They're they're birds. They're very much, they act like birds. And they talk about how they act like birds. And they have clutches of eggs and everything like that. But they are the scavengers. They're the pirates. They're the ones who are most willing to deal with humans out of anybody in the covenant because they like the money. So right. that's just in their design and how they act is how I imagine the crew. Very much so. Um, and the crew are just fun. They are just so fun. And I love, they're another enemy, kind of like the orcs, where like, no hard feelings. Like, oh, you killed my friend. Eh, you should have ducked. Like, they, it's no hard, because it's all, it, it's all just very professional and strictly business to them, right? So like, yeah, one of our guys got killed by yours. Happens. Like, it's, there's no hard feelings. This isn't going to be a problem later in the book. It's just, yeah, I was Ooh, sad when he died but I liked when he's like trying to explain that whole scene where he's like mm, no the meat there's something wrong with the meat like are you talking about their DNA I, I guess <laughs> like right. that whole concept of them having to go back and forth with that was really fun and the idea that yeah because and that's one of the things about the Tau and we'll talk more about that here in a bit but the Tau are still a very naive and youngish race within the galaxy and they haven't seen all the stuff that the humans have so like once the gene stealers get revealed and the tower like no 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 no, we want no part of this there is no greater good out of this <laughs> there is no greater good when you're dealing with these things but like the fact that they're just aghast when they explain what the gene stealers do and they're just like what like it just like the whole concept offends them mm-hmm. which is really funny and interesting but I have to say I because it's been so long I just remembered like the high notes of the book like I remember there was something with gene stealers I remember they were dealing with the Tau and I actually got to the point right before they go down into the underworld where I was like did I mix this story up like did I just like create an amalgam story because I don't think the gene stealers are in this book oh wait no there they are (laughs) (laughs) as soon as the pure strange showed up and then of course Yes. Who would want to escalate a war between the Tau and the humans? It was so within the Gene Stealers' idiom. It was practically a gift when the Imperial Guard showed up. I'm sure they were like, manna from heaven. Here we go. I mean, because it honestly could have been, you know, Xenos haters as well. To be totally honest, it really could have been. It could have been, yes. But once it's revealed to be the gene stealers, you're like, oh. Oh, it's like, oh. Makes total sense. Got it now. Which is one of the things I like. I love when an enemy is used perfectly. <laughs> like that chef's kiss of, oh, yes. This was like the perfect. And I, I think if you've listened to this podcast for a while, you know my feelings on the gene stealers. Even I was like, oh, sublime. That's the perfect use for them. I agree. And um, I have to say, though, going back really quick, I didn't I didn't see Greece again because it's been so long. I just kind of figured because we've seen so many planetary governors that are just inept. They're just (laughs) inept and corrupt. Just your standard run of the mill corruption. Right. From rogue traders. Well. You know, also just, you know, because the, so the tower there. So I was thinking mm-hmm. of, oh, that fifth Ultramarines book, because there's that whole thing with the tower. And as soon as they touch the governor, wow. So mm-hmm. that's kind of why I was seeing, seeing that Governor Grice was on their side, because mind right. control. It just kind of made sense for me. And I'm we're used to seeing governors be weak to town mind control, as well as being fat and useless. Yes, and when he talks about how inbred he looks, 
that's something that there's actually it's i think it's in the brothers of the snake book they go to this planet to witness like the new inauguration of this new king and they get there and the space marines are like ew like they're so disgusted and disappointed by him because he's so inbred they're just like oh this is disgusting and he's like this like they're like he looks just like fragile twig and then he insults them terribly inadvertently um he's like you all look identical and they're like no we don't (laughs) but you know if you're not familiar with space marines um but I just kind of figured it was going to be that. Just your standard run-of-the-mill. Yeah. I don't have a whole lot going on upstairs. Right. And but no. then, you know, you find out why he's fat. And that third arm comes out. It's like, man. Never see the third arm coming. You never see the third arm coming. And just, again, like, when you think about it again with the gene stealers, right? Where better to hide? than in an inbred looking right. planetary governor who everybody has written off as an imbecile. It's just, again, it's just perfect. Like, of course, of course the gene stealers would have loved something like that. Of course. It's Which a little is snack. Another reason to hate the damn gene stealers. <laughs> just like they managed to find all these really great ways to, you know, the gene, you know. thing about the gene stealers is that I almost find them more terrifying than the Tyranids just because of how subtle they are. I can agree with that. So there was a a terrible uh, Dark Angels game that I reviewed, and it was about uh, Space Hulk. Oh, right, right. So it's the Dark Angels exploring this this Space Hulk, and, you know, it starts... They do run into gene stealers, because, of course, they do. But when you get to lower levels, when you find the pure strain gene stealers, like, shit gets scary fast. Uh-huh. And it was really terrifying, to be honest, while, while playing most of the time. I do like the idea, because as you said, we don't see a lot of blunters. And it makes sense, because they use mind control. But I liked the idea that once they see Jurgen, they're kind of like, not him, though. Like, see, we'll, that, like, we'll that's come back where, to that. See, that's where I got worried for him. That maybe he was a gene stealer or some Xenos off-breed just by the way that they reacted to him. That's fair. Because, yeah, they are very... And, and, and even Caiaphas Kane notices, right? Where he's like, ooh, that's... That's that's different. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, like, the, I, I, they seem hesitant. And because I, mean, I think he even made a joke about it at first where he's like, do even they realize he stinks? Like, is it that bad? Um, and then when he sees it again, right? Then when Jurgen shows up to save him. Yeah, Love because Jurgen distracted them with his miasma. That's actually probably one of my favorite gags of the whole thing, talking about his miasma. You know, oh. and they all hesitate. That's what gives Kane the opening he needs to yeah. take out the governor. Yes. Yes, I forgot it. I forgot that he calls it a miasma. I do love that. So let's talk about the Tau really quickly because we both read the fifth book, the Ultramarines book, with the Tau. Um, we read that book with um, War of Secrets mm-hmm. with the Tau, which has some interesting implications. Bill, um, this is a different way of seeing the Tau, though. Yeah, it's they like an are... agreeable way of seeing the towel, which was, I was like, bitch, don't make me like the towel. <laughs> right? Um, oh, man, like by the end of the book, I was like, I y'all have to be so reasonable. <laughs> you you use I had mind to remind control myself, and have a past system. I had to remind myself that they're being reasonable because there's something they want down the line. Yes, it's it's works for their greater good to work together to find out what's going on, why they're mm-hmm. keep trying to perpetuate this war, because how else are they going to take over everybody by mind control if they can't figure out what's the root of this problem? So I right. just had to keep reminding myself of that. It's like, you know, it, yes, they're being nice and agreeable, but it's because they want something bigger down the line that may not be worth exactly be nice and agreeable. So it kind of helped in a way that they all were, got killed by the gene stealers 
because they were going to, I mean, eventually there was going to be a war anyway. Unless they all left. Very much they're like, oh, Jane Steelers. And nope. Yeah. Peace. You guys can have um, this place. <laughs> right? It was a little, again, because for me, the mind control thing that they utilized to keep the population in in check, never forget. Um, that bothers me. Their caste system really bothers me. Like, that in and of itself, I think you and I were just talking about, because we're going back and playing the Dragon Age games, that first game, Dragon Age Origins, you spend a lot of time in Orzammar. In Orzammar, the dwarves... Way too much time in Orzammar. I I forgot how long you spend down there. Um, But it's a caste system, and it's awful. Yeah, basically, that whole mission, missions that you do down there in Orzammar, whether you're on the deep roads or not, you realize there is no good guys here. There are um, no good guys. Like, kind of very Warhammer 40k in a way. Like, there's nobody good. There's just picking who's less bad. <laughs> less crappy. And really, when you're down there with the dwarves, like, had they not created that whole Bronca subplot with her being truly awful? I... That that was kind of like the death by firing squad or death by hanging. Yeah, it was. I mean, on a different day, the answer might change. But yeah, with the Tau, especially with that caste system, like I want to hate them, but then you're reading this and you're like, oh, they they do come off as being very reasonable, right? Because to your point, they have an agenda, and they are a very patient people. Right, because I think even Kane mentioned Unlike that humans. that they're that they look at the long game. And not, and not what's immediately in front of them. So they're fine with working together with everybody now and making the peace because they have an agenda for the future. And it may take several generations because, you know, they already started, you know, because they already had the Xenoist cults. So they had already, you know, started, you know, with the uh, right. indoctrination. But they don't care how long it takes. They really don't. And... You're right, because they have so much subtleness, and they really want to understand the planet, right? You can't really, you can't accuse accuse them of le- leaping before they look, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which is also so frustrating. <laughs> Especially when you compare them to the humans, right? Who were all too happy to be like, get out. But then the other half of the humans are like, all too happy to be like, yes, come in. We want peace and love and happiness. And to sing Kumbaya mm-hmm. in the sky, but not on the warp. Um, just, it's a very interesting way to see it. And it, we ha- we don't often see what made this so interesting. Obviously, they start fighting the gene stealers and things get out of hand. But this is one of the first times, actually, uh, I guess kind of, we've seen it a little bit in a couple other books that spring to mind. But the majority of this book is very much just a tense, I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, it really is a standoff, right? Where they're like, neither one wants to, neither one wants to blink first. The right. Tau don't want to get involved with the Imperial Guard yet. And the Imperial right. Guard do not want to get involved yet because they recognize how bad it would be for either side. And we don't really get to see that very often because you don't ever do that with the orcs, right? right. If the Drakari are in your planet, you're not going to wait around and see how the politics lead. <laughs> no. Uh, no, 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 no. Same with the gene stealers. As soon as you recognize it's gene stealers, well, by fire be purged. And I think a lot of it has to do with also when they get there, they notice that the planetary defense force, they're a bunch of assholes. And so they're trying to figure out well, what's wrong with them. Like, why do they want to start a war they can't finish? Like, right. right. Right now. So there is, so it was, you know, kind of like we have to be friends with our enemy here to understand why our friends are acting like enemies in a weird right. roundabout way very much and when you think about it at its heart there is just a, this is kind of just a mystery right right what's going on who's behind this assassination why is the pdf so weird <laughs> and it's really funny because I've, I've made this joke before like with movies if you watch a movie where the cop is the main character then the cops, the detectives are the good guys who just want to find the bad guys. And those FBI guys are shady assholes. But if you watch a movie 
where the FBI character is the main character, then the FBI are the good guys on the search of truth, and those cops are incompetent assholes. Like, or, just, or, or supremely corrupt. Right. And it, this, like if you read the Jack Ryan books, right, the CIA guys are the ones that have it all together. But those FBI guys and the local police just cannot be trusted. Yeah. <laughs> so my husband in the military says he he does not have nice things to say about the CIA. I'll put it that way. I don't think anybody except Tom Clancy did, really. Um, but, like... It reminded me of that in so much for these books, because the PDF, if you have a PDF character, the PDF are just as valiant as the guard. Okay? Stop making them sound like they're baby guard. And they're also better than the Arbites. I actually thought of them as security guards, to be totally honest. So it's really funny, because that's basically, if you're reading a book about the Imperial Guard, the PDF is like... The PDF is to the guard as mall cops are to cops. Like, they really are. They are kind of like the galactic mall cops. Um, they have a little bit more power than the Arbites, depending on it, right? Um, but yeah, and I felt... So, it, it's just, again, it's so funny because we're reading this guard book. God, those PDF people are incompetent. And they're kind of like... Maybe they're on them, more right? like the constables, if you think about it. Like, like in our police force, the constables have a little more power... But no one's running to them for help. <laughs> right. Or like um, like or state gosh, troopers. Even the sheriff's department. I mean, depending on where you live. Because I know some places, even a small town, the sheriff is your right. only police department. But generally, like in a big city like Dallas, we do have, we have state troopers. We have, the, you know, Dallas PD. And there are sheriffs and constables. And I tell you, no one calls the sheriffs or constables for anything around here. Unless you need to serve papers. I have a friend who's a state trooper, and he's really funny, because he t he'll flat out be like, yep, I can write the hell out of a speeding ticket. <laughs> like, that is, but that's like, it, it's funny, because again, like I had, there are some books out there about some PDF members, and um, there's also a book series about some Arbities, and the Arbities, they're the ones, they're the ones who have it together, but that PDF force cannot be trusted. It's always really funny to me mm -hmm. when it's just depending on whose view you're looking at, right? And the PDF does not seem overly impressed. Like, I love when Kane, when they come across that barricade and they have to kill the PDF members, which is awful. But I like when Kane's, like, trying to use his authority because he's so accustomed to the Imperial Guard who would be like, I'm not arguing with the Commissar, man. PDF don't give a crap. Right. Like, who is this guy? They don't, they don't care. They don't really understand because the PDF really doesn't have need of Commissars. Um... But that scene, that was particularly, right? Like, so see, oh. I can also see the PDF doing the same thing with the Inquisitors. I mean, most people know who the Inquisitors are, but I could just, the way the PDF acted, like, you know, respect my authority type thing. I could see them pulling that same shit with the Inquisitors. Like, your word doesn't hold here. It's like, that's just when the Commissar would have to back away. But, eh. Right, and be like, oh, dear. I'm going to let the Inquisitor take care of that. <laughs> Now you've made her angry. <laughs> you don't like um, her when she's angry. No. So the narrative structure of this book is very interesting, too, because it's really told... There's really four stories going on here, right? There's Kane's story. There's Amberly Vale's story through her footnotes. And then there's Logar. Hysterical. Her footnotes are hysterical. There's Logar's historical retelling, which is hysterical. And then there's Sulla future Sulla's memoirs of this. So first off, did that narrative structure work for you? Yes and no. Because okay. honestly, Tell me more. so I actually had a very big tendency to skim through Logar and Sulla's stuff because as Amberly said, they're not good writers and it's boring. So I would really, I did not read that very closely. I just kind of skimmed through like, yeah, I kind of see what they're saying, but does this really have that much of bearing? Not really. So I'm just going to keep on going here. I love it. I especially love Logar's writings because Kane is very matter of fact, right? He's like, well, this is what was happening. This is what was happening. But he's very myopic because he's seeing it through his point of view, right? And when you look at like his cut forward, look, I was just trying to live. Um, and then you read Logar's stuff, which is, Logar's stuff is like 
zealous in the extreme. Yeah. But it's also kind of thumbing their nose at like documentary documentarians and historians, right? Like being like, hey, sometimes these guys get it not entirely accurate. And they're, this guy, especially Logar, is so wrapped up in the emotion of it. And the rogue trader stuff is it remains my favorite gag in the whole book when he's like, well, clearly it was rogue traders. <laughs> yeah. Like, everything ends with being the fault of rogue traders, which I again, mean, it's in the name. Love... Rogue. You can't trust anybody right. with, with You that can't trust these people. No, you can't trust it. Honestly, I absolutely he love reminded it. me of Father Frater Matthew. And he was writing his kind of his yes, memoirs. he's so zealous. But then you have Sulla, who Sulla is doing these kind of grandiose. It's not zealous; it's no. just very pompous. serious and sentimental and pompous. And the thing that I love about it is that Kane's writings are very different from Vale's footnotes which were very different from Logar's prose, which were very different from Sulla's prose. Yeah, I mean, I, like, got, I got to hand it to Sandy Mitchell to be able to write in that many different voices like that. Like, I, I know that you're supposed to be able to do that, like, a, as a writer, but to, but typically what you do as a writer is that your narrative is one voice, and then you're able to do the dialogue of the characters in a different voice, but to not only take the dialogue of the characters in a different voice, but also write narratives in different voices within the same book is really difficult. It's really difficult. And really the only other person we've seen do it exceptionally well is Chris Raitt. And it's in the Watchers of the Throne books oh. where, yeah, yeah. yes, where all three characters, they're very different tones and they're very different language. And but even a, just... then though, I don't think it's as great of an accomplishment as what he did here because these are such distinct writing styles. It's more than just a tone. It's about the Very writing style. Very much so. And, you know, honestly, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could come up with a completely different writing style and stay true to that halfway through the book. Now, it was only like, you know, a few pages, but that is very hard because you have your writing style. Like, I would dare say that the reason why these books do so well is because this is just Sandy Mitchell's writing style. This is just how he writes in general and that and that works for him but to be able to write in a completely different a s writing style is hard I don't think people understand how hard that really is it's almost and it's not just it's almost that. like you just got like another like like another writer to come in that's how good it is what it reminds me of is one of the things that so when you're going through like when in, co in college or in high school whenever you take an art class and you really start studying classical paint painters and you learn that picasso was in fact an exceptionally talented artist right picasso could paint beautiful landscapes and before he became picasso right right and so that was one of the things i remember one of my professors saying was just like you have to be exceptionally skilled at something to then break it down and do a bad version of it so Sulla's writing I felt like so my husband when he first read the book right he understood that Sulla was a bad writer but me I got a particular kick out of it especially reading it aloud because I would read like a whole paragraph and I'd be like to be clear that's one sentence so like the fact that he had all these run on sentences and just these bad word choices right? like I felt like I'm like okay so this is He's a, he's a very talented author to know how to write this badly and recognize that it's this bad. I have a feeling what he did, mostly this is what I would have done. Not that I'm a mm. great writer or anything, this is what I would have done. I would have written it, written it in my words and then gone back and changed it. To be like, read, probably read it, be like, okay, this needs to be like this so it could sound like mm -hmm. this, yeah. Because otherwise then, I think you'd get too lost in what you were trying to I say. Think you, would and with Logar, Logar was probably the easier one because all you have to do is just over exaggerate right. and put a lot of pomp and circumstance into it, right? And just be like, Look how beautiful and like really florid this is. Perfect, right? That was probably easier. But Sulla, and again, the fact that you have two bad authors who are bad in different ways, mm -hmm. very impressive. But I thought it was kind of fun. Because especially at the end, Sulla's, Sulla's story becomes so much more important because downstairs, literally, 
Kane is dealing with gene stealers, but upstairs there's crazy stuff going on with the PDF and the Tau, which Kane's not privy to, and you do kind of have to know because in the back of your head you're like, what the hell is going on on the surface right now? And so Sulla is kind of there to provide that. I think that it's a really interesting, because it's almost told more like, um, if you've read World War Z, it's told in a historian documentary style. Uh, this provides more of a documentary style to these. Like, it makes it look like this really is a historical record, that mm. somebody's going to look through this at some point to try to re-piece Kane's adventures, as it were. I thought it was really fun. And of course, Amber Lee's footnotes. Oh my god. Yeah. I think my favorite one was not the most flattering description of his of his of the holy emperor's <laughs> ordos. <laughs> the emperor's like pet psychopaths. Uh, tell me tell me there's not a better description for the Inquisition. I, I can't. Like, oh my god. And to your point, like, you do discover certain things, right? Like, sometimes she gives you a little backstory. Like, okay, right. don't, we'll explain this later and talk more about this later. Um, But when you find out, when she's like, I've known him to wake up from nightmares. It's a subtle thing, but it really tells you a lot about both characters, right? Right, because well, it tells, like, he's full of shit. He does care more than he says he does. And also... By the way, we were a thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, but it, it's just one of those things that just kind of fills in. Like, I think about, again, I use that reference a lot, but like the paint by number. Right. When like you finally fill in that one color and you're like, oh, it is a giraffe. Like, it just fills some more in about Kane's character and Amberly Vale, too. And it's just a really nice, I appreciate a good footnote in life. And this is particularly good annotation because again it just little bits of color little bits of commentary and it also i guess it does add kind of to, i love the idea of an inquisitor having to go through a commissar's memoir and be like uh, no <laughs> like uh, maybe not <laughs> like and she has some she has some i can't remember what it is but there's some footnote where she talks about how she's like, look for more information on this. You can pick up this book that's available at any Ordo Hereticus library. I did love that. I was like, yeah, I'll be right on my way. <laughs> Make it right on top of that, darling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's like 50 people in the galaxy who could get to that library, but okay. Yeah, Thank you. Maybe the Black Library has a copy. I don't know. I know, right? <laughs> like, All one. of a sudden, yeah. Araman has entered the chat. Pretty much. That actually was uh, pretty good. So now that you said Armin, I was playing Dragon Age 2 today. Got to a side quest. The boss's name was Ariman. I had to put down the controller. I was laughing so hard. And yes, oh my God. he was a mage. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I mean, Look, Armin's just a good mage name, you guys. It really is. Like, his whole, actually his whole name, Ozek Ariman, like... That's just a good name. Like, I actually don't... If you've ever tried to read the book Dune, I'm really not a big fan of the book. I have a really weird soft spot for the David Lynch movie. Um, but, like, I don't... I'm not a big fan of the story of Dune, but I do love the words in it, like the Sardaukar and Arrakis. <laughs> Best names ever. House Atreides. So good. I'm a sucker for a really good name, and yeah, Ozzy Garamend's one of the ones that I'm always like damn that's a good name right Logan Grimnar that's another one I'm so, always like yeah that's a great name even Ragnar Blackmane that's a great name it's a really good name too damn some I was gonna say some of the Primarchs but I'm trying to think now Jagatikon's a pretty good name that is a good name <sighs> Ferris Manus is not I hate Rabute's name Rabute Gulliman's name I he's my man but I hate the name Gulliman's fine I'm with fine. you on that Gulliman's fine it's the first name that needs a serious do over yeah, because Reboot's fine. Rebute is right out, and knowing that that's the official pronunciation, y'all. It's just not working for me. I do like Lionel Johnson. That has a nice ring to it. One. It does have a nice ring to it, yeah. I 
Uh, Amberly Vale. Beautiful. That's a great name. Amberly actually, Vale. Actually, Amberly is a very pretty name. Isn't it a really pretty name? Um, so I actually had to go back. So when we had my daughter, we had talked about a few like really nerdy names. My poor child came this close to being named Nymeria, and I'm so glad we didn't do that in hindsight. Ew, like um, after Game of Thrones or Song of Ice no, and Fire? No, after Song of Ice and Fire. I changed and it. Then I changed it. I would have, I think we would have had to legally change her name, to be real. Um, Amberly did come up in conversation. That would have been so acceptable, people, because I think that sounds like a normal enough name. It does. It really does. But that's that's a really good name. Actually, Caiaphas Kane, man. That's a, it's a good name. It's a good name. It just, like, barks out, too, like a commissar. Commissar Caiaphas Kane. <laughs> I would like to read a quick this. passage that made me laugh out loud to the point I read it out loud to everybody in my family, and I thought my eldest was going to pee his pants. Well, now I have to hear this one. <clears throat> <clears throat> Get my reading voice going. All right. A few more las bolts from behind the crates confirmed the identities of the rebels lurking there, making a mess of our paintwork in the process. Sean laughed really hard at that. So I triggered the flamer, sending a gout of burning Promethean down the alley. The results were impressive. The crates bursting into flame and the rebels behind them got caught in the backwash. They burst into the open, their clothes and hair on fire, shrieking like the damned, and Jurgen cut them down with the bolter. Their bodies exploded under the impact, spraying the walls of the building with burning debris, and I was incongruously reminded of fireworks. Reverend. Oh my god, I laughed so hard. It it's just a funny book. And here's the thing, much like Infinite and Divine, and this is why the humor works. Because it is like obviously Caiaphas Kane is kind of making fun of himself, right? But it's not making fun of the universe. It's not thumbing its nose at oh, no. the universe. Mm-hmm. It's taking it very seriously. And even though, because even though he's very funny and self-depreciating he's still a commissar and he's still scary like he walks up and just shoots those two troopers because he recognizes them as being under a gene stealer effects right mm-hmm. the guy's not messing around he's not a joke and that's and much like infinite and the divine where <laughs> Trazen and orican were very serious characters and what was going on there was very serious it can still be funny while still being serious and that's one of the reasons that this works so well is some of the things that he says calling the Inquisition the, the pet psychopaths. It's not necessarily making fun of the Inquisition. It's just kind of telling you how a common trooper would look at those guys. It's just very cl- colorful language. Very colorful. Very colorful. Very clever. It's one of the reasons I think that these kind of remain timeless within the Black Library catalog because they're just fun and i don't want every book to have that silliness and stuff to it like it works great with the orcs right the orcs are supposed to be funny like i'm thinking about like brutal cunning mm-hmm. the orcs are just hysterical they're supposed to be hysterical um i don't know that i would want every book like this so i kind of think of it like the marvel cinematic universe for example mm-hmm. like let's look at guardians of the galaxy okay always hysterical very funny very it's supposed to be funny but at the same time there's some very serious moments in there because very much really, so. really deep themes but it's funny it works for it it would not work being that funny in a captain america movie no because that doesn't fit his character um like thor ragnarok worked i think the reason why that works so well is because that storyline is an 80s staple and they kept it that cheesy and i loved it but it would not have worked if all the movies were like were that silly like like even iron man which gets silly would not have worked being that over the top silly and i see and, and i see that a lot like with, with, with this like sometimes it works like orican and Trazen, that totally worked this works with caiaphas canes it definitely works with the orcs do i think this would work with the eldar and the um the um fuck jagatai khans legion the white, the white scars. scars do you think that would have worked with them no that doesn't work. It wouldn't work with the Dark Angels, the Dark uh, Angels no. either. It would. It kind of works with the Space Wolves. We've seen that with Lucas the Trickster mm-hmm. a little bit. But really only Lucas. And Lucas right. is renowned as being an outlier. Ex- right? Exactly. Um, 
couldn't have the ultramarines like this. You couldn't have, um, oh my God, you mentioned the Iron Warriors being like this. I mean, no. Yeah. It, I would be it, so disappointed. <laughs> right. It works for it. And it's nice that, you know, there's a time and place for it. And in this case, it's not college, it's in Caiaphas Kane. It does. Part of it is because he's human, I think, because he's baseline human, right? Um, but he's he's not a space marine, right? Where, like, all personalities basically been driven out of him, right? Um, yeah, except for that one black Templar. I love that guy. He tells but jokes. even he, even he, it's kind of a dry yeah. sense of humor, right? It's not this type. And even this... It's funny through start to finish, but it's not like slapstick. It's not, Mm -mm. it's, I think it's like the perfect amount of humor and I like it that it's, it makes it very unique. I, again, as I said, I wouldn't want everything to be like this tone and this like level of humor because I think it would start to come off a little forced. Like some of the, like the later Marvel movies, especially like Thor 2, some of the jokes just kind of feel forced and flat. Were there jokes in Thor 2? Because if there were, I didn't catch them. But then again, I fell asleep every single time I've tried to watch it. Yeah. Um, some of the, But some of the gags in some of the movies, like a lot of them hit, but sometimes you're like, mm, that was a little forced. Um, because they just feel like, okay, we have to get a joke in here. Um, I, I felt that way about, uh, what was that movie? I hated that movie in general, but Justice League. I felt like a lot of those mm. jokes were very forced in there and maybe like one out of five hit for me. Um I wouldn't want everything like this. I love that Caiaphas Kane is like his own little bastion. It's, you have all this seriousness and then there's Caiaphas Kane over here. Funny, gets the right jokes, gets the right humor, very respectful of the universe still and very respectful of the character. Even when he's hiding and not wanting to poke his neck up because he doesn't want to get killed in the middle of a bar, basically a bar fight between two regiments. He still can Which, pop like, up. Which, like, you can say that's scared. hardest, but I'm like, that's just smart. You know? Yes. Very, very much so. I also... That's something just dawned on me that we didn't mention really, that I want to mention quickly, mm-hmm. because I think it adds to the humor, too. The fact that his background is a little... Like, when he talks about how his parents were cowards, and she's like, I'm pressing X to doubt here, because that doesn't add up. Um, That also adds to the humor, though. That it's like we don't really know everything about this guy, and well, I mean, when Amber Lee tells him you could just try being yourself, and he has that small panic attack, he's like, I don't even know what that is. That to me was incredibly telling of who he is. He has so. constantly changed who he is to fit the situation so much he doesn't really know like who he is. And so in his head, this whole coward thing, that's just what he's built himself up to be because what he thinks he is. But I don't think that's really what it is at all. I don't. Yeah, I agree with you there. And the fact that he also like when when they're underground and he's like, oh, man, I'm a hive kid. Like, I got this. Right. I can I can tell noises. I can tell all this stuff because I'm a hive kid. But he's in a regiment of Valhallans who I love the Valhallans, by the way, in general. But he's in a little regiment of Valhallans who grew up in a very strange... Like, when he talks about how they always have fans and air conditioning on. Right. Always. So he's like, oh, I've my great coat on. Um, he, As you said, he's had to be so many different things. That also adds to the humor, too, though. But again, it's humorous. But there's also a lot of depth there. There's actually a lot going on to Caiaphas Kane. Kind of like Trazen and Oregon, right? There was a lot going on with those guys. They weren't just these kind of slapstick funny dudes. I I always love anything that's really funny but has a surprising amount of depth. And Caiaphas Kane's really very much like that. And the well, stories too. She, that moment. He's just like, I don't even know who that or what that is. Like that's that's mm. huge. Very and much just the so. shock on his face when Sol is like, I just thought of what would Caiaphas Kane do? And he was like, What would I do? Like <laughs> 
you know? He's like, oh no. <laughs> well, I think because Eve doesn't even make like a gag where he's like, I hope you did the opposite. Yeah, it's something just, like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's funny and it lands and he knows that. But that's, and I think that's the thing about him that I love the most is that he really is a master manipulator. Like, yeah. but again, is he really? Like, yes, he's manipulating people, but, but there's so I much think, truth to him. Man, I don't know if that, I mean, so that is being manipulating, but I think that's also being in charge. Very much so. Severina Rain was manipulating. Oh, just in very a different much way. So. Oh, very much so. But like, when you, when you compare, say, him to Severina Rain, Severina Rain was very much a no nonsense, I am a serious mm -hmm. commissar. Kind of like Gaunt, kind of like Victor Hart, like a lot of the commissars that we've seen. They are not messing around, but they can still be personable, which I like about the commissars in general. But especially his, especially because he keeps saying he's like, you will never be friends with these people because you are outside of the chain of command and you are there to shoot anybody who runs. Right. Right. But at the same time, I think he has developed a friendship with the colonel and the major. And to coin a term of yours that I hate, I ship the two of them so hard. I do too. <laughs> um, so I say that a lot because my daughter likes to give me a bad time. Because I'll say that. I'll be like, I ship these two. And she'll go, Ugh, you sound like a My Hero fanboy. So that's why I use it a lot is because it makes me laugh. Um, I just figure that you think it makes you sound cool. I don't know. No, You're always trying I used to get all it. hip with your, you know, imager lingo. With my reddits. Yes. Um, I use it a lot because it. if anybody has a teenage daughter, you will understand. I will just start throwing a lot of that slang around. But, like, I am shook right now because I'm shipping them. And she'll get, like, really embarrassed. It's actually one of my threats. Is like, if she's not doing something, I'll be like, I will go into the locker room with you and all of your teammates and I'll start saying things like yo I am shipping these two characters that stuff's whack like I will start just like throwing out so slang and she'll whack. just be like mom <laughs> she'll be like mom you can't I'm like oh yes I can like I can't even think of some of the words like I can throw out a whole string of them and so then I end up using them like in regular speech because I'm like it's silly and it makes me laugh but it embarrasses the hell out of her which yeah, is see, my I job as her mother. I haven't gotten to where like I could say that stuff in front of Gabe's friends because I don't think they'd care. It's supposed to be boys and girls though. Oh, but, it is. You know what? Honestly, I don't think any of her teammates would really care. I think they would just be like, "Sure, Jan." Well, I mean, <laughs> of course they don't care. It's the kid that cares. But I don't think, honestly, oh, yeah. my kid would not care. Oh, she does. Which is you're right. It's probably the difference between boys and girls. But it's uh, one of my secret and joys yeah, so what in I, life. What moms can do with boys is when they go off to school, when they walking away from your car, you roll down the window, and like someone's like, "Remember that I'm gonna pick you up this day. I love you so much, honey." Because that embarrasses the shit out of boys. Yes, I bet it does. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. I can say that, and she would just be like. <laughs> That's just an eye roll from her, but oh yeah, I like when my, I try and my cousin yep, saying with her, with her oldest son, like he was being all kinds of snappy and rude to her when she's take, mm -hmm. like, dropping him off, and he uh, got out of the car and slammed the door. So she rolled down the right. window and was basically said, "She's like, now remember, I packed you a special treat in your lunch, and I'll see you right after school, and I love you so much." And she said he turned so bright red and everyone was pointing and laughing. She's like, yeah, I'll show you how to t treat me in the mornings. <laughs> thing, the thing that I had the other day with her that I was able to embarrass her because she was being a butt for dropping her off for practice. So I'm sitting there, right? And I was just like, ooh, that's a weird flex, but okay. Mom, stop. So then I got to do the sheesh. And she, mom. What is that? Stop it. It is this some TikTok thing where they do this thing and they do the sheesh? I don't know. I don't know. We're not allowed to have TikTok in this house. But anyways. We aren't either. But I know that I Gabe, the the Gabe watches, like, she probably does too, the YouTube comp compilations of some TikToks oh, and stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So it's, it's just funny, and I love to do it. Anyway, since we got off track, what are we reading next, Carrie? 
What correction are we reading next? <laughs> well, the plan. Do I get to open my box? Was to read Hellwinter Gate. Oh. <laughs> and um, as I'm preparing the book to put on the website and everything, I notice on Goodreads it says Space Wolves number three. I was like, what does that mean? Click on that. Yeah, this is the third book in a series that Chris Rate has written. So I'm glad we discovered this because otherwise we'd be reading this book and going, who are these people and why do we care? And we would have been bitching about it on the podcast and the Skywatcher adept would probably come up and be like, uh, you idiots. It's from this, 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 and this. And he would do all these citations to show how dumb we are. So we would be like, he's right though. Yeah, be like, we got to take this video off YouTube immediately. So. And then pretend it never happened. Right. You know, kind of like uh, messing up who died in Silent Hunter. So, anyway. um, So. Then off the internet. I just have to live with that shame for the rest of my life. I remember that Teka Harangi was in that book. (laughs) Anyway. So, we've decided since... I'm going to clarify this. Nothing that we both want to read is out for Black Library. That's the big stipulation here is that we both have to agree to read it. And uh, so we decided to go back to another old school book and we're going to read the first book in the series called Blood of Asaheim. Just to kind of see where this goes. So we'll get to Hellwinter Gate eventually. But of course, we're not going to we're not going to read Blood of Asaheim and then Stormcaller like back to back because we learned our lesson with uh, Fabulous Spell. I was like, who was that? It was a fabulous Spell. So we might be going back and forth until Black Library you know gets back on the schedule for books that we would like to read. <laughs> to be, to be yeah. absolutely clear here. So yeah, we'll be bouncing back you know between Caiaphas Kane, probably going back to Ariman. We got plenty of those like back burner books we can always get into so and if so much so and if you've never read blood of asaheim like we didn't even know this this existed we had no idea so in hindsight it makes a lot of sense everything makes sense in hindsight kind of sometimes i look at stuff and i'm like why though this one makes sense in hindsight i was like oh i guess we probably should have figured that because like when i was looking at the description for hellwinter gate i remember thinking oh Okay, I think I'm supposed to know who these people are, but we can figure that out later. And then... Yeah, so we're going to figure out who these people are. We are. And I'm really excited about it, because Chris Rate and Space Wolves and and Death Guard. We've never read a Chris Rate Space Wolves book, right? No. Um, No, not for the podcast, we haven't. Well, then that means I never have either, so... Right. um, So, yeah, I I love Chris Rate. I'm very curious what his take on the Space Wolves are, so this should be... This should be interesting. And we, I mean, we all know it's thanks to ADB that I've made my peace with the Space Wolves. And I think if anybody else will help me keep that peace, it is going to be Chris Rate. It be with you. Yes. Either him or Guy Haley, but I think Chris Rate for, for sure. I hope we didn't just like overhype ourselves, but I also have faith. We I think we're both going to enjoy it. So I'm excited. Probably did. But regardless, I mean, we can also say he wrote in 2013. So he's grown as a writer. Teen. Yeah. Oh, God, is it that old? Yes, yeah, 2013. Mm-hmm. Damn. Okay, then. Yeah. So before the rift, before the dark times, for the even darker times, I guess. <laughs> anyway. So that's what we're going to be reading next week. Um, I guess we're, we're copies but digital copies I know it's available yeah. on Amazon digitally you can get mass market paper paperback they're between 20 and 40 dollars on Amazon and you can get a hardback between 35 and 125 dollars on Amazon but you can also get the Kindle edition uh, for or the, any ebook edition for much much cheaper and sorry it's not an audiobook old old book is old I guess I yeah so Anyway, maybe it'll come back on audiobook later since they came out with this. It is weird, though, right? That they have a limited edition for this third book, but they don't have the audiobooks for the others. I don't know why I'm questioning what Black Library does at this point in my career. Uh, at this point, just go with it. Yeah, right. Exactly. Just go with it. So 
Anyway, so you guys have listened to the Warhammer 40 Club book book club episode regarding Caiaphas Cain for the Emperor by Sandy Mitchell. Be sure to join us for our next book, Blood of Asaheim by Chris Raitt. We are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast on anywhere you get podcasts. Don't forget, we also have a Patreon where we offer two different tiers of content for your viewing and listening pleasure. You can learn more about that at patreon.com slash wh40kbookclub. Our site also has articles about our adventures in reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books, so please stay well and read from a crack. I'm still all furious. Get you some chartreuse or pewter. I mean, they both look good. I know, they both look so good. God, I love that special edition. (laughs) All right, good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.